I'm really excited about today's presenter. With us today is one of the premier experts on blockchain, blockchain technologies. Chris Bennett is the Chief Learning Officer at the Blockchain Training Alliance. I also recommend his Blockchain Beard Guy podcast series. Chris, it's all yours. Let's get started. Awesome. Uh, well, thanks, Jim. Um, appreciate you if you have me today. I'm real excited about this. Uh, as Jim mentioned, my name is Chris Bennett, Chief Learning Officer with Blockchain Training Alliance. Um, if you're on LinkedIn, you can find me, Blockchain Beard Guy. A um, <clears throat> little bit about me, I come from a 22-year background in custom solutions design and delivery. Um, got involved with blockchain about four years ago, and, and when I finally realized what it was, um, got very excited. Um, I saw a level of transformative change coming that I'd seen a couple times before. The last time I saw it, uh, we didn't call it blockchain, we called it dot com. And the time before that, uh, we didn't call it dot com, we called it the PC revolution. Um, but when I realized the scope and magnitude of, of the change this technology was going to bring, um, decided to focus my career on it. But uh, I know you guys didn't come here to learn about me today. You want to talk about blockchain. So let's go ahead and dive in. Um, for those of you maybe really new to this technology, let's just start with defining some basic terms that you're going to hear all the time as, as you continue your journey into the blockchain world. Um, terms like immutable, append only, ledger, consensus. Um, let's talk about what, what these mean, <clears throat> and then we can really give an accurate definition to a blockchain. Um, when we talk about immutable, we're talking about data that, that's permanent or uh, very nearly permanent, data which can't be changed or edited or deleted, or at least uh, not without a, a lot of work on the part of an attacker. Um, we really have a much more permanent record of something uh, than when we we would get in a database or a place, uh, a piece of conventional technology where we only store it in one place. Um, one of the interesting things about a blockchain is it's missing two critical features you get in a, a traditional database system. Uh, the ability to update data and the ability to delete data. Um, and that's not an, an oversight or a limitation, that's actually a, a big benefit. It gives us a really detailed audit trail. If something changes, uh, we don't update that record. If that piece of data is no longer relevant, we don't delete it. Uh, we simply add a new record to the bottom of the ledger, uh, indicating that that value has changed or that value is deprecated. And so we get a full version history for all of our data points, a very, very rich audit trail. So we can always go back and tell the story of how any of the assets we're tracking came to be in their current state. Uh, we have a ledger <clears throat> and uh, a little bit about me, like I mentioned, I come from an IT background, uh, not a finance or accounting background. So when I got into blockchain, I heard this word ledger uh, and mentally, uh, I just always associated that with some sort of record of financial transactions. But when we talk about a ledger in the blockchain, we're talking about something much more generic. Uh, we're talking about a log, we're talking about history. Um, that can be the history of financial transactions transactions. It can be the history of non-financial transactions. It can be the history of anything we deem important. Um, and then finally, consensus. And when we talk about consensus in the blockchain, this is just a very simple idea that says we're always going to assume that the truth is whatever the majority of participants believe that it is. So when we talk about blockchain, we're talking about this immutable append-only ledger. Um, multiple copies of this ledger are stored around the network. We don't put it in just one centralized place. Uh, we talk about blockchain as being decentralized technology. Um, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And all the nodes on a network are always attempting to reach consensus on the contents of the ledger uh, so that we can have a very, very high degree of confidence in the integrity of our data. Right, so how did we get to this point? Well, for a lot of people, myself included, um, the first introduction we have to blockchain is Bitcoin, uh, the world's first blockchain. Um, just coming up on, <clears throat> on its 11th birthday, went live in 2009. Bitcoin is a very, very specialized blockchain. We use the ledger and we can use these ledgers to track the history and evolution of anything we care about. Well, uh, in Bitcoin, we only care about one thing and that's the history and evolution of Bitcoins. Um, who's owned them? How have they been transacted, etc. 
We just have one single shared ledger, and that's that's very important. Any platform which attempts to manage a currency um, is, is going to display this feature. If we had multiple ledgers, right, and one said that I paid Sally and the other one said that I paid Bob, um, well, who really got paid? So it's very important we just have one ledger per network. Bitcoin really is what we call a blockchain 1.0 platform, the first generation of blockchain. And all this means is it's just a ledger. It's just that historical log. It's nothing more um, than just a historical log. Um, and so we look at a sample Bitcoin transaction. Um, by the way, you guys will have access to this slide deck after the presentation. Um, if you open it up in PowerPoint, be sure to turn on the notes section because uh, on many of these slides, I've included uh, links, follow-ups, articles, if you want to dive in more um, in that notes section. So be sure to check that out. But you can see an actual Bitcoin transaction here. Uh, and you can see that we're just tracking an exchange of, of uh, financial value. If we wanted to put some kind of custom data in here, if we wanted to track something other than a Bitcoin, uh, you'll see there's really no good place to do that. This is a very fixed and rigid data structure. All right, so fast forward six years, 2015, uh, five years ago, big, big year for blockchain. Um, the, the two biggest platforms in the blockchain space both go live, the first being Ethereum. And Ethereum was designed uh, as a platform to address um, what some of the perceived shortcomings of Bitcoin were six years in. Uh, probably Ethereum's biggest contribution, um, there were two big ones. Ethereum gave us a little bit more flexibility in the data that we store on the ledger uh, so we could track financial transactions, but now we could track any other type of asset as well. Uh, and then Ethereum's big contribution to the blockchain space is this idea of smart contracts. Uh, again, this is another term in blockchain where it's, it's easy to, uh, to get caught up. Um, I always assumed contract to mean a legally binding agreement between two or more parties. Uh, when we talk about smart contracts on the blockchain, we're just talking about some computer code, some code that can get executed or invoked uh, in response to records that we're recording on the blockchain. Um, there's nothing inherently legally binding about a smart contract, uh, so don't read too much into that term as you hear it. <clears throat> and if we look at a, uh, an Ethereum transaction, you can see just like Bitcoin, we can have financial transactions. But we can also have non-financial transactions as well. Um, here's a screenshot from an exercise we run through in our Ethereum developer course. Uh, we have the students playing with a sample elections application. Uh, and you can see here in this screenshot down in the bottom, uh, we're recording a vote for Oksana Davis in the election to see who is the coolest person in Mike's class. Um, so we get a little bit more flexibility. Um, then at the end of 2015, a project called Hyperledger goes live. And if you've heard this name before, uh, there's a very, very good chance you view this as an IBM product. Um, all of these platforms that we're talking about are open source. And uh, if you or, or any of your customers, clients, vendors, partners, etc., want to implement them, uh, you don't owe any licensing fees to anybody. They're not proprietary offerings. IBM just happens to be one of the 220 corporate backers and sponsors of Hyperledger um, and one of the most vocal. They're the only ones running primetime TV ad spots for blockchain. Um, but Hyperledger is not a proprietary IBM offering. Um, Hyperledger is very interesting because where platforms like Bitcoin and Ethereum have really focused on the consumer side of blockchain, uh, Hyperledger is really focused on the business or enterprise side of blockchain. Uh, and so it has some, some very different paradigms. You won't see uh, any native currency or coin or token, at least not in its current iteration. Um, just like Ethereum, we can use the ledger to track any kind of asset we want. But what makes Hyperledger really powerful is now I can have multiple ledgers and I can secure them all differently. Um, so my transactions with Alice can live on an entirely different ledger than my transactions with Bob. And by the way, Alice and Bob can have a ledger they share together that I have no insider visibility to. 
Uh, so we have a much greater emphasis on security and permissioning, things that matter much more in the business world. Um, and if we look at a sample hyperledger transaction, uh, you can see our, our data structure here is very freeform. Uh, in this example, we're looking at an auction site. and We've defined that all of our members in this auction site uh, are going to have an account balance, an email, a first name, and a last name. Um, I can define any properties or attributes I want. Uh, so much, much more flexible. And so to really understand why this is important, uh, we can step back and, and we can look at the platforms that we hear so much about right now, uh, which tend to be the platforms on the consumer side, uh, the Ethereums of the world, the Bitcoins of the world. And if we were to describe those types of platforms, uh, we might use these attributes. We might say we have a decentralized ledger. Uh, this ledger can store any type of data we want. Uh, this ledger is shared with all participants on the network. Uh, the data is permanent, it's immutable, it can't be changed. Uh, our users are anonymous, and so by proxy, <clears throat> uh, all of our data is fully transparent. You'll note uh, when we go back and look at, at like an Ethereum transaction, um, it's very, very difficult for anyone to determine who the human beings are um, behind these identifiers. That's not the case in an enterprise blockchain. Um, <clears throat> but again, if, if all my users are anonymous, well, uh, identity is a prerequisite to permissioning and security. If I don't know who you are, I can't define and enforce permission. So I have to make all the data fully transparent. Um, we rely on group consensus, whatever the majority says is true. We have smart contracts. We have the ability to add our own logic onto the blockchain to build applications on top of it. So if we step back and we ask ourselves, well, are these properties desirable or not in an enterprise setting, we get a bit of a mixed bag. Um, in an enterprise setting, having this decentralized ledger, which can store and manage any type of data, is likely advantageous. But the fact that that ledger is stored, or I'm sorry, shared uh, with all the participants on the network, that's generally not what we want. Uh, in the business world, we generally want to control who can see and view which parts of our data. We want to define what they can do with it and when and under what circumstances. Um, the data on the ledger is immutable. It can't be changed. Uh, obviously, this is a desirable thing in the enterprise world. Uh, think about names like MCI WorldCom, Enron, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers. Um, would these names have the same association they do today? Uh, if these organizations had tracked all their financial data on a permanent, unchanging ledger, um, my guess is probably not. Um, anonymity and full transparency, the two things that make a public blockchain work are very likely the two least desirable qualities to have in an enterprise or business solution. Uh, again, we want to know who our users are, not only for that audit trail, but so that we can define what different users can do and what data they can consume. Um, and then a very interesting thing happens when you go to an enterprise blockchain and all your users are identified. They're no longer anonymous. That means that we can move away from group consensus towards something called participant consensus. Um, and that just simply means if Alice and Bob have a transaction together and they're the only two participants in that transaction and they both agree on the outcome, uh, they don't need anybody else's help or involvement to settle that transaction. Um, very subtle but powerful shift. Uh, and then finally, smart contracts, the ability to build applications on top of this platform, um, definitely something desirable in an enterprise setting. So what we're really starting to explore with blockchain now on the enterprise side uh, is how do we build solutions which keep all these items in green and address some of the items in red. Um, <clears throat> as you're going in and, and talking about blockchain and your organization or other organizations, um, it sometimes can be very, very difficult uh, to identify a good blockchain use case. Um, and if you go out on the web, there are lots of great resources, decision matrices, flow charts, surveys, um, but a lot of them are, are designed once you've done some discovery. Um, they can be very complex and involved. 
And uh, we saw very early on um, that what the market was lacking was a very simple litmus test to see, hey, is, is blockchain worth looking at in this circumstance or not? Uh, and so to fill that void, we've put together these uh, simple four yes, no questions that you can ask yourself uh, as you're evaluating a blockchain use case. Uh, so let's real quickly just kind of run through these. Um, a good blockchain use case typically looks like this, uh, three yeses and a no. Um, if you come up with three yeses and a no, it doesn't mean blockchain's necessarily the right answer, but it, it certainly is worthy of further investigation. Um, so question number one, do I have one or more assets I want to track? Uh, in other words, um, do I have some things that I care about and I want to track them uh, in my organization, in my enterprise? Um, you might have a perfectly valid business use case, which has nothing to do uh, with, with tracking an important asset. Um, through its life cycle. Um, but if, if you do have one or more assets you want to track, and these can be physical, uh, intangible, right? It might be an automobile, a piece of real estate, some intellectual property, uh, patent agreement, a uh, piece of code, uh, anything. Um, <clears throat> So if you have an asset you want to track, well, hey, having this permanent ledger uh, that we can record its life on that, that is uh, very difficult, if not impossible to change, likely provides a lot of value. Um, do I care about the evolution or the life cycle of these assets? Um, sometimes we don't. Sometimes all we want to know is the current state or to see a snapshot in time. Sometimes we don't don't need that history. Um, but for a lot of the, the critical assets we manage uh, in, in many organizations, the answer to this is yes, we really do care. We want to be able to tell that story later on uh, in case anyone asks questions. And again, uh, if that's desirable, having this permanent append-only ledger that gives you full version history built right in with no extra consideration um, likely provides a lot of value. It's not to see, say that you can't keep that kind of version history in a database, um, but it usually requires some extra work, some extra steps. Uh, with blockchain, it's just baked right in. Um, <clears throat> all right, so we have some assets, and we, we've said, yes, we care about their life cycle and their evolution. All right, well, question number three, is that life cycle or evolution, um, is it well-defined? Is it well-governed? Are there rules in place? Um, most often the answer to this question is yes. Uh, for example, if, if the assets that we care about are expense reports that field employees are submitting, uh, we might have a rule which says an expense report can never have a status of paid before it's had a status of submitted. How would that work? Um, there are very, very few assets in the world that just evolve randomly. Uh, and so if, if you are working with assets that follow a well-defined and governed life cycle, well, being able to automate and facilitate that life cycle through the use of smart contracts, developing your own custom logic, um, that's, that's likely to be very valuable. Um, you can view blockchain as being a workflow or business process automation or management solution in this regard. Um, and then question number four, am I the single voice of truth for any and all questions about an asset? Um, now, most of us, um, the, the vast majority of us, the answer to this question is no. Uh, for most of us, we are simply one custodian of a critical asset over one point of its overall life cycle. Um, if you think about an iPhone, um, <clears throat> If you have questions about an iPhone, who do you ask? Well, it, it depends. Where is it at in its life cycle? If it's still in the design phase and you want to know about the specs, uh, how much memory is it going to have? Well, you ask Apple. Uh, if you have a question about manufacturing, though, Apple doesn't manufacture their phones. They subcontract that work out to companies like Foxconn. Uh, so if you have a question about the manufacturing schedule, you have to know to ask Foxconn. Um, the manufacturer doesn't deliver those phones around the world, though. They're contracted with international shipping organizations and local logistics companies. So if you have a question about when your iPhone is going to show up, when's it going to be uh, here stateside, 
you're going to have to ask one of those transportation or logistics companies. Uh, if you have questions about what is the rate going to be uh, on, on my mobile plan, am I going to see any kind of increase? Uh, is my mobile provider going to support all these new features Apple's designed? Well, that's a question for Verizon or T-Mobile. Um, and very often, the problem is uh, we have a question, but we don't know exactly who the right custodian to ask is. Um, it is very, very rare that your organization is going to be the single authoritative source of truth for any and all questions about that asset from beginning to end. Um, so again, if, if you walk away with three yeses and a no, uh, that's a very, very good sign that blockchain may be a good fit and certainly is worthy of more investigation. Um, and those, I think, are nice, simple questions you can have with any kind of non-technical stakeholder in an organization um, and really, really get some, some good information out. Um, I think one of the, the best symptoms of a good blockchain use case um, is, is when someone in the back, uh, usually a technical person, raises their hand and they go, hey, wait a minute, um, why are we talking about all this stuff? We could just use a database. Um, and so to explain that a little more, I'll tell you a very, very quick story about the National Association of Realtors. Um, National Association of Realtors, or NAR, is a trade group here in the United States that is made up of over 1,200 different uh, fully independent member organizations. And they had a, an idea for an initiative for many years. They wanted to build a member engagement database uh, to track what realtors were doing in their local market. And the idea was quite simple. I live here in Denver, Colorado. It's winter time. Uh, assume I'm a realtor. I'm, I'm working in the real estate market here in Denver. Uh, and I decide, you know what? It's a brutal cold winter. I'm done. I'm going to go pack up, move to sunny San Diego and be a, a realtor there. Um, well, if in Denver I was uh, volunteering with the Chamber of Commerce and uh, donating time to some outreach organizations, NAR wanted to track that. So when I got to San Diego, they could help get me plugged in to the San Diego Chamber of Commerce and to similar outreach organizations down there. Now, everybody loved the idea. The individual realtors loved the idea because it helped advance their career. The agencies and organizations that those realtors represented, they loved it because it was a great way for them to demonstrate delivering value back into the communities that they serve. And NAR liked it because their constituent organizations and members thought it was a great idea. There was only one small problem. And that was trying to get 1,200 CEOs, each of whom represent fully independent organizations, to all collectively agree to give up ownership and control of their data to be put in a centralized system that they don't own or manage was a non-starter. And that's a great example of what I'm talking about here, um, that if, if you're having a conversation about a blockchain use case and someone throws their hand up and goes, hey, why, why are we talking about blockchain? Couldn't we just use a database? Um, one of the best ways to pick that apart is to follow up and say, okay, well, uh, if, if a database would have worked for that, if you could have used it, why haven't you yet? And there's only two possible answers. Nobody thought to do it yet which is exceedingly unlikely for a technology that's been in production use for over four decades, or it's something like National Association of Realtors. The barrier is not a technical one. Uh, it's a people or political problem. Um, <clears throat> we'll explore this a, a little bit more. Um, this, this really kind of came up last year at the Geneva Auto Show as well. Um, I like to talk about blockchain as being IT spending 2.0. Um, meaning for about the, the past 35, 40 years, uh, organizations have been spending on IT, spending on technology, because they want to increase collaboration, communication, transparency, and efficiency within their organization. And certainly not everyone's at the point of nirvana yet, but we're starting to see diminishing returns. Additional dollars spent on internal IT is yielding uh, few and fewer increases in, in these four items. Um, blockchain and the decentralized technologies that go along with it uh, are really the second wave of IT spending. And now we're spending on IT 
to get those same benefits, collaboration, communication, transparency, and efficiency, but we're gaining them between organizations, across organizational boundaries. And this is critically important because we're starting to see seismic shifts in the business world and the way organizations engage and operate. Um, there's a really, really great example of this. <clears throat> you can see in the notes of this slide, um, Elizabeth Blackstock, a reporter for Jalopnik Magazine, filed this story I mentioned at the Geneva Auto Show last year about how there are too many cars, too many manufacturers. The idea here is that the automotive industry uh, is undergoing incredibly large transformation right now as they move away from internal combustion uh, towards electrification and as they work to uh, make more intelligent, connected, autonomous, and someday self-driving vehicles. Um, all of this technology is incredibly difficult and expensive to develop. It's so difficult and expensive um, that there's really no one single automaker that can afford to go it alone. And so we're seeing some very, very interesting relationships, partnerships uh, that, that I think even a few years ago would have been unimaginable. Um, <clears throat> headlines like Ford and Volkswagen teaming up to develop electronic vehicle technology. Uh, Daimler and BMW, Mercedes and BMW, uh, collectively investing over a billion dollars to co-develop some of this technology. Um, well, this presents some interesting challenges when it comes to our IT infrastructure. Um, if Ford and Volkswagen are teaming up, if BMW and Mercedes are teaming up uh, to jointly co-develop this technology that they're both going to own, well, whose database is all that stuff going to live in? Are you going to put it in Ford's database or are you going to put it in Volkswagen? Uh, is, is there a good answer to that question that's not going to lead to a lot of heartache and contention and heated arguments? Um, what we really need is this IT spending 2.0, this truly shared IT infrastructure between organizations. And that's exactly what blockchain is. Um, this creates many, many new concerns when it, it comes to project management, uh, budgeting, change management, your DevOps process. Um, all of these points that can be sometimes painful as we work on technology to initiatives within an organization uh, are going to become much more critical when we bring multiple organizations to the table. Um, what happens if my information security practices are good and your information security practices are good, but they're vastly different? Um, these kind of differences are very, very difficult to accommodate in centralized systems uh, where one entity owns it and then shares it with others. Um, <clears throat> another way you can think about blockchain, a, a little bit of a philosophical conversation, um, it's about the difference between a piece of paper and a contract. What, what is the real difference between a piece of paper and a contract? And uh, immediately your mind probably jumps to, well, it's, it's the signatures. And that's absolutely correct. But think about what those signatures mean. Um, I could take out a piece of paper and I could write down on that piece of paper, um, that Jim owes me $10 and we have agreed that he's gonna pay me $1 on the first of every month for the next 10 months. Um, that fact doesn't have any weight without signatures. Uh, if Jim signs that piece of paper and I sign that piece of paper, um, what we're saying is that we both agree with that fact at this certain point in time. We both endorse that fact. Um, and that makes that piece of paper uh, much more real, three-dimensional. It gives it a lot more weight. Um, <clears throat> well, you can view blockchain and, and database as being analogous to this. Uh, a database is a piece of paper. I can put down any fact I want on it. Uh, but it's not recording who believes or endorses those facts. Sometimes that's okay. Uh, if I'm already an accepted and trusted centralized authority, um, that's okay. Um, but oftentimes in the business world, that's not the case. We want to have a little more weight. It's not just enough to record what the facts are. It can also be critically important to document who believed or who bought off or who endorsed those facts at certain points in time. Uh, consider for a moment, if Boeing had this technology in place right now, 
certainly, I, I don't think it would have done anything to alleviate some of the mechanical or design issues they're facing with the latest 737. Um, but if they were able to tell a very detailed story of exactly all the design decisions and exactly how that plane ended up the way it did with the parts and the configuration that it did. Um, do you think their brand and their reputation and by proxy their stock price uh, would be suffering the way that it is? Likely not. Um, <clears throat> so imagine uh, put all efficiency concerns aside, um, what if all the most critical interactions in your enterprise, the ones that matter the most, the decisions uh, that you know are going to be auditable or that someone might ask questions about or that you might need to justify later, um, what if all of those critical interactions could not only be captured but also signed off or endorsed by those participants, even when those participants cross organizational boundaries? Um, you can probably start to imagine a lot of areas in the enterprise that would benefit from something like this. Um, <clears throat> I'll just talk a, about some general good use case patterns, um, and then, then we'll look at a few real world use cases. I have a, a few more in the slide deck and we'll probably have time to cover. Um, but again, I've got links to all those. You guys can, can dive in and investigate some of the interesting ones. Um, then as Jim mentioned, we'll leave a little time at the end for Q&A. Uh, so when we talk about good use case patterns, there's a, a big misconception in the marketplace right now uh, that blockchain is a technology which aims to replace your legacy systems. Uh, and so what we end up hearing a lot of is, uh, hey, Chris, all this blockchain stuff sounds great. It's very exciting. I would agree with you. It's the future. But listen, um, we just spent the past three years and $8 million upgrading our ERP system. The project was massively over budget, behind schedule. Everybody was stressed. Uh, we finally got the upgrade done. It's, it's working like it's supposed to. Um, so yeah, I agree. Blockchain is exciting, but um, come back in a little bit and, and talk to us. We have no appetite to do another um, legacy system upgrade, replacement, etc. And that's really a, a terrible misconception because that is not what blockchain aims to do. Um, all else being equal, the proper use of blockchain is, is to act as a layer above your legacy system. Um, it works to open them up to a larger ecosystem uh, that, that can sit on top of your legacy systems and act as a storyteller. Uh, give a detailed, rich, auditable story about how all the assets being tracked and managed in that uh, traditional line of business system came to be how they are. Um, we use the analogy in class that blockchain is a lot like hot sauce. Um, it, it's not an all or nothing proposition. Uh, there's nothing stopping you if you're hungry from just pouring a big bowl of hot sauce and getting a spoon and uh, having that as your lunch. Um, but you're probably not going to be too satisfied at the end of your meal. And blockchain's the same way. Uh, just like hot sauce, it's, it's best when you sprinkle blockchain on top of something uh, that's already tasty, already delivers value. Um, so think about <clears throat> systems integrations. Uh, this is one area where blockchain really shines. Uh, what if you're a manufacturer, but you rely on resellers to sell all your products? Um, if I'm one of your resellers and I meet with a potential customer, uh, close a big deal, well, the very first thing I do when I walk out of that meeting is I'm probably going to pull out my phone. I'm going to log into my CRM system, uh, Salesforce, uh, Microsoft CRM, whatever my organization's using. I'm going to find that opportunity and I'm going to mark it closed. We've now got a deal. We've got an engagement. Um, <clears throat> well, how does that update in my, or in my CRM system uh, propagate into your ERP system because now you have to start manufacturing uh, those items. Well, traditionally, these integrations are very rigid. Uh, they're hard couplings. They're one-off integrations. Uh, they break very easily. Uh, and traditionally, they don't give us any kind of audit trail. Uh, and that can be the, the most critical part. Um, might be beneficial if 20 years in the future, we could look back and tell a very detailed story about exactly how that change in your CRM system propagated all the way down to my manufacturing floor. Uh, again, think about an organization like Boeing and if they had this kind of technology in place and could tell those kind of stories right now. Uh, I think it would be a very, very different narrative. 
Um, a lot of confusion right now about blockchain and database. Uh, a lot of people look at these two technologies uh, and view them a bit like uh, Ford and Chevy, Coke and Pepsi, Republican, Democrat. Uh, they, they somehow compete or butt heads with one another. Uh, and that is absolutely not the case. Um, it's really not a contrarian relationship. It's a lot more like peanut butter and jelly. Uh, they were both designed separately to do different things, but when you put them together, they go so well together uh, that, that you can't help but wonder if they weren't designed that way from the beginning. And even though they look like they do very, very similar things on the surface, uh, when you dig in a little bit and look at what were they designed to do, what's the primary function of each, uh, you see that they're actually very, very different. When we talk about a database, a database's primary function has always been to rapidly store and retrieve large volumes of data. Um, <clears throat> And a database is always focused on keeping a certain minimum level of performance. Uh, in other words, performance is greater than history in a database. And I'm sure we've all experienced this. Um, if you've done any kind of software architecture or design, um, databases will happily drop a transaction or two to maintain performance. Uh, if we're starting to get near that minimum performance threshold and you submit a transaction, um, a database will very likely just ignore it. And the expectation is you keep resubmitting that transaction until you finally get an acknowledgement back, a confirmation back. Um, blockchain is the exact opposite. In a blockchain system, you will never have to resubmit a transaction. Um, blockchains offer what we talk about is 100% transaction resolution, uh, meaning every single transaction will get recorded, but that will happen at the expense of performance. Um, but you can start to see that the primary design principles behind these two technologies are vastly different. Um, okay, so if I'm designing a solution, where do I store my data? Well, uh, all else being equal, think of your database as being the home for your data. And blockchain is this layer that can sit on top and ask, act as the historian or storyteller. I can tell this rich story of how all that data came to be in its current state. Um, you might say, you know what, hey, all that's great, but I, I need decentralized data storage. Um, it, it doesn't make sense for me to put everything in a centralized database and layer blockchain on top. Uh, think about the, the Ford Volkswagen example, a Daimler BMW. Um, it's not just enough to put all that data in a database and layer blockchain on top um, because that database is still going to have an owner, an administrator. And sometimes we need decentralization at that content storage layer too. Well, luckily we have some other decentralized technologies. These are not blockchain technologies, but they come up all the time in blockchain conversations um, because they play very, very well with blockchain. Technologies uh, like storage.io and IPFS, the interplanetary file system. Um, these are protocols, just like HTTP. If you think about how HTTP, the exact same protocol, is used to run the internet, and it's also used to run your intranet. The only difference is the size of the network. Uh, well, all these technologies are the same. Uh, you can use the publicly available ones on the internet. You can set them up on a private network behind a firewall on a VPN. Um, and technologies like IPFS and storage um, give you content-based addressing, not location-based addressing. Uh, very subtle but powerful shift, which means any content we store there, uh, documents, images, videos, uh, anything we want to manage. Again, we get a full version history. Uh, if we upload a new version of a document, it does not replace the old one. Um, we don't have any duplicate content items. If you think about, uh, I think mean, all of us have felt this pain. Hey, I'm looking for the latest version of the spreadsheet. Uh, is it the one on my local desktop? Is it one out on the network? Is it the one in my inbox? Um, I see three out in SharePoint. Uh, one is spreadsheet underscore final. One is spreadsheet underscore final two. Um, and then one is spreadsheet underscore final in all caps, which is the right one. Um, well, these 
these kind of concerns go away. Um, and maybe most critically, the content stored on these platforms, uh, it's, it's what we call sharded. It's broken up into small pieces and your content doesn't live in only one physical location. Um, this is very, very important from an information security point of view. That means if uh, I'm able to penetrate some of the nodes on your network, I'm not stealing all of your data. I'm only stealing a portion of it. That's much, much different from how things are today. Uh, where if I can compromise the security layer of your database, uh, I can get everything, all the data. Um, so like I said, a, a few use cases, I'll skip over some of these because uh, links to these uh, articles or, or source material are in the notes. Um, and you guys are, are able to go back and read some of those. Um, but I'll just call out some of the, the real interesting ones. Um, you know, first of all, what's the potential for this technology? Well, the World Trade Organization has estimated that over the next 10 years, um, blockchain could add an additional $3 trillion in international trade and commerce. Uh, $3 trillion for reference is roughly the annual GDP of the entire nation of Germany. Um, so we're talking about over the next decade, uh, adding an additional, uh, Germany to the world's commerce, international trade and commerce. Um, absolutely tremendous growth. Uh, even if they're only half right, even if they're only 25% right, it's still staggering to think about. And really all of that growth uh, is gonna be coming in the enterprise market, in the B2B market. Um, we're probably not gonna see most of that $3 trillion uh, come from the consumer market yet. Um, <clears throat> I talked about the National Association of Realtors. Again, if, if you wanna dig in, learn a little bit more about that scenario, it's a really great uh, five or six page non-technical white paper, uh, very consumable by a non-technical executive audience, um, and really speaks well, I think, to a pain point maybe a lot of us have felt in the enterprise world. Um, you see a lot of interest in blockchain right now in food supply chain, uh, a lot of grocers uh, looking to implement blockchain. Uh, in fact, Walmart came out uh, towards the end of 2018 and told all their leafy green produce suppliers uh, that they had until September last year to be on the blockchain. Uh, so if you've been in a Walmart since September and you've seen leafy green produce uh, out in the grocery section, uh, all of that produce is being managed via the blockchain. Um, the reason food retailers, grocers are so interested in blockchain right now uh, is because food recalls are tremendously expensive, not just because you have to get the word out, uh, you have to recall the food, you have to refund the customer their purchase price, and then you have to destroy the items, you can't put them back on the store shelves. Um, but far and away, the, the biggest cost to these kind of events is the damage that it does to your brand or reputation. Um, Think about the association uh, with Chipotle right now. Uh, once the darling stock of Wall Street, um, they still haven't fully recovered from the E. coli scares a few years ago. Uh, if you're above a certain age, the name Tylenol still evokes memories of a cyanide scare in the 70s. So these types of events are tremendously expensive and getting out ahead of them by having much greater visibility into where these food items come from is exactly what groups like Walmart and Carrefour are doing. Um, again, just to speak to some of the potential of this, uh, Mercedes-Benz, their parent company, Daimler, um, they've committed to investing $110 million to do blockchain pilots and R&D projects. Um, $110 million is more money than most organizations budget for all their technology expenditures. Um, and this is $110 million not to put something into production, um, just to, no pun intended, go kick the tires. Uh, I don't think we'd be seeing organizations of this caliber make this scale of investment if there was not a tremendous future in this technology. Um, <clears throat> Consumer Aviation, Air France, Singapore Air, uh, exploring this technology to do so many things. Um, looking at tokenization to reward customers their frequent flyer miles. Um, groups like Air France KLM are looking at uh, how can we auction off empty seats on a plane? Um, how can we demonstrate lower carbon footprints than our competitors uh, to make a passenger feel better about choosing our brand over another's? 
Um, blockchain in the public sector, um, some incredible potential there. Uh, and really leading the charge right now is, is the UAE, particularly the city of Dubai. Uh, the city of Dubai has an initiative right now called Smart Dubai 2021, uh, which is an initiative to make Dubai the highest tech city on planet Earth uh, by next year. And blockchain is a big part of this initiative. Uh, the, the city is working to move all government record keeping and operations onto the blockchain. Uh, and by their estimate, if they're able to do that, they're going to save enough money every year to build one of these, the Burj Khalifa, uh, the tallest building in the world. Um, you can see how it just towers over everything else in the Dubai skyline. The observation deck is at the 162nd floor. So gigantic building. It's amazing to think that just the cost savings of implementing this technology is going to save enough money every year to build one of those. Um, again, if they're only half right, if they're only 10% right, um, it's still a staggering thing to think about. Um, and then finally, uh, I'll, I'll leave with one Kerrygold Butter, uh, often referred to as Ireland's most famous brand, although I always wondered what the folks at Guinness would think about that. Uh, but if you've seen Kerrygold in your stores, uh, you've seen their, their famous claim that this butter is made from milk, uh, that only comes from grass-fed cows, not cows fed grain or feed, um, but happy Irish cows in a beautiful Irish pasture living a natural life. And all this is great, except Kerrygold Butter is facing a class action lawsuit in the state of California right now uh, for a little over $152 million for false advertising. Uh, and that's because Kerrygold doesn't actually have a way to prove uh, that their milk is entirely sourced from grass-fed cows. Uh, they're looking at blockchain and smart devices as a way to address this issue. And without being too graphic about it early in the morning, uh, if you can use an intelligent device to monitor what comes out of the cow, you have a very, very good idea what went into the cow. And if you can record this on the blockchain, because um, Kerrygold needs to work with the ranchers and the farmers uh, and the middlemen, the intermediaries, uh, all the way through their supply chain, um, well, now you can demonstrate that your product claim is actually true. All right, so I, I wanted to leave a few moments for questions. Looks like we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, so hopefully this is, has been informative and helpful, um, but let me kind of turn it over to you guys. Uh, questions, anything you guys want to talk about or, or we didn't cover that you were really hoping to get out of this? Hey Chris, this is Jim. Yeah, we have a bunch that are in here in the question and answer box. So I'll go through a couple of those real quick. All right. Let's see. First one. In any business, we always have CRUD activities, create, read, update, delete. So then when we say blockchain only, append read only, not sure how this new approach is welcomed. Gotcha. Really, really great question. Um, and I'll, I'll preface this by saying that blockchain is another tool in our toolbox. It is not a successor or a replacement for anything. Uh, and, and the people who say, well, we never need to use a database again because we have blockchain um, sound just as foolish as the people who say, hey, I never need to use a screwdriver again because I just bought a wrench. Um, they're, they're very different tools, but the, the way this actually works, if you think about a database, um, let's say you have a row of data in your database and we're tracking customer information. And one of the fields uh, about that customer is their street address. When that customer calls you up and says, hey, I've, I've changed addresses. No problem. In a database, we find that record and we update it in place. And unless we've taken additional steps with that database, that old value goes away. And sometimes, like I said, that's okay because all we want to see is the current state. We don't care about the history, but other times we do. So imagine if, if we have no provision to update and that customer address changes. Well, the only thing we can do is go down to the bottom of the ledger and add a record and say, hey, um, customer 1234, Sally Johnson, uh, no longer lives at, at 123 Main Street. She's now at 456 Happy Street. Um, when we take this approach, not only do we know what the current state is, but we can go back and see every prior address that customer had. Uh, deletes work the same way. 
We don't delete the record like we do in a database. We just add a new record at the bottom of the ledger, which says, hey, this old data point is no longer valid. And that's what gives us the audit trail. Um, if that's desirable, it oftentimes can be less work and effort to get that functionality out of a blockchain than building it on top of a database. But again, that functionality is not always desirable. It's just another tool in our toolbox. All right, thank you, Chris. Let's see another question here. Do government departments use blockchain traditionally? Um, great question. It, it really depends on, on which government, which locale, which region. Um, some do, some are still very hesitant to it. Uh, like we see, I, I talked about Dubai uh, making huge investments uh, in this technology in the public sector. Um, this is really starting to spread throughout the Middle East. Uh, their neighbors over in Saudi Arabia have a large initiative, Saudi Vision 2030, uh, which aims to replace oil and gas as the number one driver of revenue in the kingdom over the next 10 years. Um, and becoming a technology hub is a big part of that vision. Uh, if we look in Europe, you have countries like Estonia, uh, one of the world's first countries to hold a public election entirely on the blockchain. Um, so we do have some, some very early adopters. Uh, we also have some governments, um, public sector folks who look at this technology um, and are, are very apprehensive of it, very fearful of it. Um, I'm proud to say that, that here in Colorado last year, um, our legislature and governor committed to spending about $15 million of taxpayer money this year to go explore and pilot blockchain programs. Um, so it's happening. It's, it's just happening at different rates around the world, um, kind of depending on, on the uh, outlook and, and uh, uh, view and, and persistence and aggressiveness of those in charge. Okay, great. Right, let's see, I have another question here on the chat. Uh, are there any good tools for blockchain development? There are lots. Um, I, I think maybe the, the best thing to understand is, you know, blockchain is a very, very big umbrella term. Uh, it's, it's almost like using the word canine. Um, well, that could refer to a wolf out in the wild. Uh, it could refer to your tiny little chihuahua sitting on the couch and uh, anything and everything in between. Um, so there's a lot of variation within these platforms. But um, I would say if, if you're looking to get started, uh, maybe the first question to ask yourself is, hey, am I more excited about what's going on on the consumer side? Um, cryptocurrencies, digital payments, consumer apps, or am I more interested on what's going on on the business side? Uh, there's no right or, or wrong answer. Exciting times for both sides. Um, if that in, enterprise side, the business world is a little bit more exciting to you, um, Hyperledger is a great platform to start with. And we actually have a 100% free course on a platform called Hyperledger Composer, where you can get hands on with the technology, um, start writing code and building your own POCs. Uh, if you're more interested on the consumer side of things, Ethereum is a great platform. Um, and it is by far the one that you will find um, the most content on blogs, videos, how to's, tutorials, step by step guides. Um, and we can certainly point you towards some good resources in that direction. Um, but I would say, you know, decide which, which side of the fence makes a, a little more appealing to you. Uh, if it's the consumer side, look at Ethereum. If it's the business side, um, take a look at Hyperledger. Okay, and going back to one of your uh, business use cases, Sherry wanted to know if it was Walmart Canada or Walmart US that mandated the use of blockchain. And I think that was for the leafy greens. Yeah, that actually all started over in Asia. Um, and, and at least from the press releases I've seen, uh, again, I, I don't speak officially for Walmart. I can only go off what I've seen. Um, this mandate to be on the blockchain was a global one, but but their blockchain initiatives um, really started over in the, in the uh, Asian markets, particularly in China. Great, thank you. And let's see, sticking with uh, some of the use case uh, examples, can you compare how one of uh, your uh, examples could be done using a database versus blockchain? Um, well, well, again, I, I think, you know, one of the real telltale signs of a good blockchain use case um, is, is that it's addressing a problem that conventional technology hasn't been able to yet. Um, that National Association of Realtors example. Um, 
you know, I, I kind of tongue in cheek uh, show this blockchain flow chart in class and it's a very simple flow chart. Uh, the question is, do I need a blockchain? And there's only one answer and it just points to no. Um, and the point I try and make with that is if, if you can deliver the exact same value in a solution, either by using a blockchain or a database, there's no difference to the end user, then please use a database. It's going to be cheaper. It's going to be easier. It's going to be faster. Um, this is a technology that's been in production use for over four decades. Best practices are well established. There are many trained resources, etc. Um, but where blockchain really shines is in these use cases where a database wouldn't really work. Um, so you think about, you know, Walmart and its leafy green produce suppliers. Um, well, if Walmart takes on all the cost and expense of maintaining a database to track the provenance of food items, uh, and there's an outbreak, there's an E. coli scare, there's a big food recall, and Walmart goes, oh, hey, it's, it's not our fault, it's one of our suppliers' faults, and you can trust us because the data uh, that exonerates us is in our database that we exclusively manage and control, um, that might not be convincing to a lot of consumers. Okay, thank you. Let's see what we got next. Uh, what can you re recommend to start learning how to implement blockchain? What are the best basic technology knowledge required? Uh, for example, JSON. Great, great question. Um, you know, it, it really kind of depends on, on what your focus is as a technical resource. Um, in general, what you'll find, and again, there's, there's a lot of variation within the platforms, but um, blockchain in general tries to make a lot of use of open source technologies and languages and tool sets. Um, so if, if you're a comfortable JavaScript developer, or more generally speaking, you're comfortable with C style or derivative languages, um, you'll find that just about all the development in blockchain is either done in JavaScript, um, some custom variant of JavaScript, uh, and Go is also becoming very popular. Um, now, depending on, on where your focus is as a developer, um, if, if you're a UI developer, if you're building the top layer, um, user interface design doesn't change at all. If, if you're building React front ends or Angular front ends, or you just prefer good old fashioned HTML, CSS, um, there's no technical learning curve for you. Um, it's, it's when you start to get down in the data management and orchestration layers that, that things change a little bit. But I will tell you this, um, technical people, myself included, always overestimate the technical learning curve of blockchain and underestimate the conceptual learning curve. And what I mean by that is these blockchain technologies, uh, the ones that, that allow us to build applications on top of them are not even five years old yet. They haven't had time to get that complicated. So uh, you think it's going to be a huge technical learning curve and it's not. Um, but in order to, to really design successful apps, um, you have to dis kind of throw out a, a lot of principles that we have developers have, have always held to be sacred. Um, things like inefficiency isn't necessarily bad uh, or the opposite effect you get from scaling up or down a blockchain network. Um, but, but I would say if you're a developer, if you're interested, um, jump right in. It, again, if you're just looking for a platform to get started on, um, you maybe don't have a preference towards consumer versus enterprise, um, Ethereum is, is great. Uh, there's so many resources out there. Um, and again, if you guys download the slide deck right up towards the beginning, uh, on the intro slide, I've got all my contact information. Please feel free to reach out, shoot me an email, um, and I'm happy to point you towards some really, really good resources to get your feet wet. So Chris, we're at time. If you don't mind answering one more question, we'll leave it at that and uh, then we'll close out. But let's see, last question. Have you seen examples of how blockchain can be used in the financial world? For example, the stock, uh, stock trading. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, this is a very common question. Um, hey, how are people using blockchain in my vertical industry? Um, finance, oil and gas, healthcare, um, public sector, etc. cetera. Um, what you'll find is blockchain really aims to solve and, and excels at solving um, universal business problems, uh, which, which really transcend any vertical or industry. And let me just tell a, a very short story um, for those who are interested. I, I know we're over time. 
Um, but we've done a couple different design projects. One we did with the city and county of Denver uh, with their sheriff's department around case management. And it was all around chain of custody. The idea that if they go out and arrest someone, um, the police department, the sheriff's office will open up a case. And then that case goes to the city district attorney to determine whether to press charges. And if charges are pressed, that case is then goes into custodianship of the judicial system. And then after that, that case might be owned by a community service manager or corrections officer. Um, and so it's this iPhone problem. If you don't know where the case is at in its life cycle, you don't know who to ask the question to. Um, and we also did a, a very similar design project for a pharmaceutical company over in Europe. Um, they were looking for a solution to help manage clinical trials. Uh, someone signs up for a clinical trial for a new formulation they're working on. They have to go to all these different labs to get uh, blood draws, DNA tests, saliva samples, etc. Uh, and then how all those samples are processed and managed uh, can be a very long, complicated chain. And it was exactly the same problem. If you had a question about this clinical sample, uh, you had to know exactly where it was at in this very long and complex life cycle to know uh, who the proper custodian was to ask. Now on the surface, you wouldn't think that law enforcement and the pharmaceutical industry uh, would have exactly the same business problem. But when you boil it down, uh, they do. And so a lot of times uh, it can be helpful to talk about, hey, uh, what are folks doing in, in X or Y vertical? Um, but really what you'll find is, is when you boil it down, we're really trying to solve a lot of the same problems. Now, one of the use cases I had here, this slide, um, IBM's blockchain use case library. Uh, like I said, there's a link in the notes. This one can be really helpful when that question comes up because they've got filters here by industry and solution area. Um, so you can actually go view use cases, white papers, videos, uh, reference architectures, et cetera, um, for solutions that IBM has done with Hyperledger in that particular industry or vertical. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so that'll pretty much take care of it. I'll just close out the uh, webinar real quick. Chris, you don't mind going to one of the last slides there. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed today's webinar. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, we recommend a couple training courses. We have Blockchain Overview, Business Foundations, and Blockchain Architecture Training are the two courses that we recommend. Um, finally, be sure to check out the Global Knowledge website to access additional free resources like technical articles, white papers, and other webinars. Uh, thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.